thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk uh, that wants to be a kind of quick journey uh, through the different degrees of accessibility and interoperability of linguistic resources from punch cards to linguistic link data through infrastructures. So I organized the talk into two main parts. Let me see, okay, it works. First of all, I will talk about the story so far, and I will look at the story so far through the lenses of the Index Domesticus, which is one of the historical linguistic resources in our field, uh, the corpus that collects the opera omnia in Latin of Thomas Aquinas, as mentioned by Monica, uh, built by one of our pioneers, Father Roberto Busa. And part, after looking at resources when they were analogical and then the digital term, I will move to infrastructures, first of all, and then to linguistic linked open data, uh, specifically presenting a case where hopefully linguistic linked open data work, so linguistic linked open data in action, which is the LILA knowledge base. And finally, I will sketch some conclusions and my hopes for the future. So let's start from the story so far and from a photograph. And this is a pretty young Fada Buza in mid fifties. And uh, in front of him, there is a linguistic resource. So this is the Index Domesticus in mid fifties. So basically some drawers filled with punched cards. So for the youngest uh, among you, a punch card was a sheet of paper with holes uh, that, were, that was machine readable. And uh, it is clear that at this time, resources were analogical, sheets of papers, isolated. You had to take a plane and go to Father Buza's lab and uh, use the punch cards physically to query the index domesticus. But in some way, they were already pretty findable, which means that data and metadata are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. Indeed, every punch card of the index domesticus recorded one occurrence of a word in a text of Thomas Aquinas. And it was assigned by Father Buza a specific reference that identified uniquely and persistently that uh, token, that occurrence in the works of Thomas Aquinas. It was not yet globally unique and persistent, but it was unique and persistent. Well, uh, so that was the time of millions of punch cards. This photograph was taken in 1967 in the laboratory of Father Buza, just a few days before the lab was closed because punch cards were about to be dismissed and substituted by magnetic card, magnetic tapes. And after that, between 74 and 98, 80, finally the Index Domesticus was published on paper, more than 50 big volumes collecting the concordances of the words of Thomas Aquinas. Then a kind of pretty revolution uh, happened, which was the digital turn. In the early 90s, the CD-ROM of the Index Domesticus was published. And in this photo, you see Father Buza holding in his hands the box of the CD-ROM of the Index Domesticus. And uh, this is exactly what happened to many other linguistic resources through time. And uh, it was really a kind of, of, of important revolution. And in this picture, you see uh, Father Buza receiving uh, the CD-ROM of the Index Domesticus from a dove, like a kind of gift from heaven. And on the left side, you see a pretty angry Thomas Aquinas saying, if only the Holy Spirit had given me this CD-ROM in the 13th century. So it was a time of great expectation and great advances in querying and I use the technical term, accessing the linguistic resources because being accessible means that data and metadata are retrievable by their identifier using a standardized communication protocol. So this led, the, 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 the digital conversion of the Index Domesticus led to the publication, first of the CD-ROM and then of the web-based version of the Index Domesticus you see, that you see here, where data and metadata are accessible using a standardized communication protocol via the web, but not yet by their specific identifier. This means that you can query the index of mysticus, but you don't have a specific, unique, and persistent identifier assigned to each single token in the, in the index of mysticus in the web version. And we will see how Lila 
tries to address and solve, hopefully, this problem. So it was a quick journey indeed, and we are already in the new millennium. And it, during the first decade of the new millennium, it was clear in the community that we needed some place fitting it all, some place where storing our resources, where finding our resources, where accessing our resources. And that was the time when the first infrastructures started, and in particular, the Clarin infrastructure. I perfectly remember the enthusiasm of Professor Erhard Inrichs in, uh, in an old TLT uh, edition, Three Banks and Linguistic Theories Workshop in Bergen. Uh, it was TLT number seven or six, something like this. And uh, when he was talking about Clarin, and that was the time when I heard about Clarin for the first time. So in Clarin, you know about it because you are here, uh, resources in terms of data and metadata and metadata are indeed accessible, retrievable, retrievable using a standardized communication protocol. They are reusable, which means that their data and metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. And they are partly findable because metadata of resources are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier, but not yet we are at the level of granularity of the single token in a corpus and of a single lexical entry in lexical resources. So talking about again the story of the Index Domesticus, now the Index Domesticus tree bank is published in Clarin and it is stored uh, at the Instituto di Linguistica Computazionale repository in Pisa, which is the, the Italian node of Clarin. So the Clarin infrastructure makes resources in part, in part findable, accessible, reusable, but what about making them semantically interoperable? But well, there are some initiatives in Clarin towards uh, making resources and tools collaborate to each other, but not all of them uh, are steps towards interoperability. So for instance, you know about the virtual language observatory, which aggregates metadata from various sources to find a set of resources that share some metadata. So I collect the resources that are described with common metadata. Well, this is a great initiative, a great support in order to search and uh, uh, collect resources but not yet, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a step towards make them really interact. Even, and again, the language resource switchboard, uh, it's a collection of web-based NLP services which are grouped by tasks and functions. You can combine the outputs of different NLP tools in a pipeline. It's a kind of dream. You can go there and find the NLP tools that you need and put them in a pipeline, but not yet, this is interoperability. Instead, towards interoper interoperability, it, it is working the component metadata infrastructure, CMDI. Uh, most likely you will uh, listen so often about CMDI in the coming days. So the CMDI is made of components, which are groups of semantically coherent metadata elements. So metadata that describe resources and profiles, which are set of components that describe a specific resource type. So uh, for instance, I have a tree bank and the tree bank is described with a set of specific components. And then there is, and this is the important part, the component registry, which is a collection of concepts with persistent identifiers to which you can connect the single metadata. And here it comes semantic interoperability, which means linking metadata elements or components that describe the resources stored in Clarin to the concepts stored in the Clarin concept registry, which is a kind of meta language that is shared by all the resources that describe the single, that, are, that, are, that is linked to the single metadata components that describe the single resources. Well, this is very important, but it's not enough. Let me move to the next slide because there are still, still some limitations to interoperability in Clarin. And I quote here what Penila Propulu mentioned during a lingu linguistic link data cafe that we organized in Clarin at the, at the end of uh, April. So the Clarin concept registry, it's a collection of concepts identified by their persistent identifier 
which is relevant for the domain of language resources. It is implemented in SCOS, but not yet there are relations between internal concepts. So semantic inference is hindered by this missing of relations. And more importantly, there are no relations to external concepts. So there are no crosswalks to popular schemas, which is important indeed, because you want that your schema speaks the same language of the other schemas. And there are too many similar concepts. And this is exactly one, 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 what the Clavas project wanted to, to do, proposing an easier maintenance of the vocabularies used for the CMDI elements. And even the use of SCOS vocabularies is still limited to those that are in the Clavas. Uh, so the Clavin vocabulary and alignment service. To sum up, uh, in Clavin, uh, it is, there is work towards making resources interact, interoperable, using common concept stored in the CCR, uh, which is still limited and in some way auto-referential because it, it has no relations with external concepts. So a possible one step further towards interoperability of linguistic resources is linguistic linked open data from one place fits all to one place interlinks all. So linguistic linked open data wants to apply linked data principles to linguistic resources. The linked data paradigm is used in the so-called semantic web in order to make it possible that machines can interpret semantically the relations between things. Well, applying the linked data principles to linguistic uh, resources aims to make the resources fully fair, not only findable, accessible, and reusable, but even interoperable. So I just resume here briefly the linked data principles. First, first of all, use your right for things, uniform resource identifiers. Again, these identifiers. Assign unique a persistent identifier to the things you deal with. We deal with uh, linguistic resources. So this means that we deal with things like an entry in a lexicon, a token in a corpus. Use HTTP URIs to allow, to allow people and machines that have to interpret semantically the relation between the things to look up things. Third, use web standards to represent and query data and metadata such as RDF and Sparkle. Uh, I don't have time to enter the details here of RDF and Sparkle. Just let me say that RDF is the data model used in the linked data world and not only, and it is based on the concept of triples. So everything is represented in terms of triples and we, in a while we will see a number of triples. So a subject, an object, and the relation between them that is called technically a property. Finally, go with interoperability and include links to other URIs and enjoy the network effect. Okay, why to apply linked data to linguistic resources? Let's get back to that Clarin Cafe of late April. Jorge Garcia reported the reason why applying linked data to linguistic resources. It is quite trivial. Resources are disconnected from each other in separate silos. And this is exactly where a, a great resource and great infrastructure like Clarin is working, uh, collecting the resources in a number of country-based repositories and then making them hopefully interoperable. Several of them are in proprietary and heterogeneous formats. And our resources very often follow different representation schemes use different query languages, follow different annotation criteria, make use of different tax sets, and you get crazy. Because you can today find all the resources that you need in Clarin, for instance. But once you have them, you, you have to face these problems, different query languages, annotation criteria, and tax sets. So in some way, you have to make them collaborate, interact, interoperable by yourself. You know, understanding the different data formats, query languages, and tag sets, and maybe compare and maybe convert them. There are some benefits in applying linked data to linguistic resources. 
First of all, representation and modeling. RDF is a very versatile data model to represent the things we deal with every day in our resources, like standoff annotations, dependency parses. Structural interoperability, this is important. It is also called the syntactic interoperability, and it is defined as the ability of different systems to process, exchange data using a common data model consisting of shared protocols and data formats. So here, the key words are a common data model, RDF, a shared protocol and data format, HTTP, Sparkle, URIs. So this is what makes it possible structurally to support link data. Then there is conceptual interoperability, which is a way even more important. Semantic interoperability or conceptual interoperability is the ability to automatically interpret exchanged information meaningfully by using a set of keyword common linguistic data categories defined in shared ontologies. So there are common ontologies, reusable vocabularies that you can use to understand how to interpret the relation between subject and object, so you arise. Federation, you can combine information from physically separated repositories. Dynamicity, you can provide access always to the most recent version of a resource that is maintained by the data provider or developer. And finally, there is a big ecosystem. Uh, I discovered this ecosystem entering the linguistic link data community just a couple of years ago. There are several initiatives. I just put three of them, the Coast Action, Nexus Linguarum, uh, the Pretalod project, which is a kind of Pretaporte project of the linguistic link open data, and finally, the Link Data for Language Technology Community Group, which is working on web annotation and particularly on web linguistic annotation. So let's see linguistic link data in action in a specific project that applies linguistic link data principles in order to make uh, linguistic resources interoperable. So the LILA knowledge base, LILA means uh, linking Latin, and uh, uh, it's a knowledge base developed in this ERC consolidator grant that is still ongoing. And it is a collection of multifarious interoperable linguistic resources for Latin described with the same vocabulary for knowledge description. So which means by using common data categories and ontologies. So this is what I just defined as the semantic or conceptual interoperability. You interpret exchange information by using common linguistic data categories that defined in ontologies. And if you get back to the previous slide, you see that I uh, entitled this section of my talk prefixes matter because prefixes matter. Uh, you hear how, how often I, uh, I, I quote words uh, with the prefix inter, interoperability, interlinking as a form of interaction, because interoperability is really the word that uh, is proper of linguistic link data, and in particular of the link in Latin project, while clarin is an infrastructure. In, in some way, it is inside itself, while interoperability wants to connect distributed linguistic resources with a common conceptual interoperability. So how does it work? Uh, LILA is based on a highly lexically based architecture. It is highly lexically based we, because we start from a, quite a trivial assumption that everything in LILA, in LILA deals with words. So lexical resources describe properties of words and are made of lexical entries. You open a dictionary and you find lexical entries. Textual resources are made of occurrences of words in text, tokens. And natural language processing tools provide natural language processing outputs. And in particular, the output of a specific kind of NLP tool, a tokenizer, are tokens, which on their turn are the input of other NLP tools, like for instance, a part of speech tagger or a lemmatizer. But the big node is not big by chance here. So the lemmas, everything in DILA passes through the node of the lemmas. 
everything in the in the interact and is made interoperable passing to lemmas so you can query the linear knowledge base searching for instance for all the tokens in a number of distributed corpora that are lemmatized under the under, under the same lamp this is pretty easy but there is something more you can search for all the tokens in all the corpora of lila that share that are lemmatized under lemmas that have some specific lexical properties that are provided by one or more lexical resources that are interlinked in lila the good news is that we already have all these wonderful resources all that we have to do is to make them interact to keep the best from them so next slide here it is since the lemma is the central and core node of lila we spent the first two years of the project building a big collection of lemmas for Latin. And we, and we built it according to the Ontolex Lemon model ontology, which is a standard for publishing lexical data as linguistic linked open data. I will not enter the details here of the schema of the ontology. I will just focus on two classes, the lexical entry and the lexical form. So in Ontolex Lemon, a lexical entry is made of one or more lexical forms, which are the inflected forms of a lexical entry. So like, for instance, for go, go, goes, uh, going, uh, went, and got. One of these lexical forms is the canonical form. That is to say, the form that is canonically used to represent all the inflected forms. So in other words, the lemma. So what we did was just to build a big collection of canonical forms for Latin, forms that are canonically used to refer to the lexical forms, inflected forms that are found in text. So we built the Lemma Bank, which collects around 200,000 uh, canonical forms for Latin, and which is the core of Lila. And from the Lemma Bank, in particular from one example from the Lemma Bank, the lemma admiro, which, which in Latin means to admire, to respect. And from its URI, we will see the, a number of lexical resources that you can see here in the slide that are currently linked to Lila. So let's go there and let's hope that everything works. So this is the data sheet for the lemma admiro in the, in the lemma bank of Lila. Uh, technically, this uh, page shows the properties assigned to a subject. So this is a subject identified by a unique and persistent identifier. And then there are a number of objects, like for instance, this one, verb. And then there is a property, a predicate that connects both of them. So as pos. So this subject, as part of speech, verb, it is a verb. And this property is defined in the Lila knowledge base. OK, let's move to a graphical visualization. And we will see here that this node represents the lemma, so the canonical form for Admiro, which has a graphical variant technically called a written representation, which is Amiro. To this node, and this is the lemma bank, are linked all the resources that are linked in Lila. So let's start from a lexical resource. So we have for, La for Latin, a Latin wordnet. The Latin wordnet, like all the other wordnets, is made of lexical entries. So this is the lexical entry for Admiror in the Latin wordnet, which is linked, and this is a triple, a subject, an object, and the property. And this lexical entry is linked to its lemma in the lemma bank by this property that is called canonical form defined in Ontolex lemma. Well, Admiror is then linked to its synset. So for instance, Admiror here evokes again another property defined in Ontolex Lemon, this specific synset. This synset as a definition, regard highly, think much of it. And on its turn, this synset is evoked by two other lexical entries of the Latin wordnet, like estimo and amo. And on the turn, estimo is linked by canonical form to, sorry, <laughs> to the lemma estimo with the graphical variation estimo in the lemma bank, and amo is linked to the amo lemma in the lemma bank. What can you do here? Let's search for all the tokens 
in the corporal link to Lila of those lemmas that are linked by canonical form to a lexical entry of Latin word that, that evokes a specific sense. What are you doing? You are exploiting the information and meta information, which is stored in different kinds of distributed resources. So now let's focus again on Amirov and let's see another feature of the Lemma Bank. Amirov is connected by the as base property to the base of Mirus. Base of Mirus is nothing but a connecting node that connects all the words in the Lemma Bank that make use of the same lexical base of Mirus. So for instance, uh, Miraculosus and uh, Miraculum and uh, Mirabundus. So what can you hear here? You can search for all the tokens in all the corporal link to Lila that are linked to a lemma whose base is the base of Mirus. Okay, among the lemmas connected to Mirus, there is Mirus. So now let's focus on Mirus and let's see two further lexical resources. The first of them is Latin affectus. So you know about it. Every lexical resource is made of lexical entries. And this is the lexical entry for Mirus in Latin affectus, which is linked by canonical form to the lemma Mirus in the lemma bank. Latin affectus is a polarity lexicon. To each of its entry is assigned a prior sense, which in this case of Mirus, as polarity positive. So this is used for sentiment analysis purposes. And to the positive node are linked all the lemmas in Latin affectus that are assigned a positive polarity. So what can you do? You can search in all the corpora of Lila for all the words that are assigned a specific polarity, for instance, for, for instance positive in Latin affectus. But from Miros, we can see another resource, which is the etymological dictionary for Latin. So this is the lexical entry for Mirus in the etymological dictionary for Latin by Devan published by Brill. And each of the lexical entries of the etymological dictionary in Lila is assigned an etymology. And in this case, the etymology has to etima. And these etima are respectively, this one, the Proto-Indo-European root used by Mirus, and the Proto-Italic root used by Mirus. But there is something more. The two roots are interlinked by an etymology link, which says the source and the target. So the Proto-Indo-European root is the source whose target is the Proto-Italic root. And on its turn, the Proto-Italic root here is the source of the target, which is the Latin word. So from Proto-European to Proto-Italic to finally pro to finally Latin. One of my dreams is that to this Proto-European root are connected all the tokens in all the corpora of all the languages that make use of that Proto-European root. So uh, that's enough for what concerns lexical entries. Uh, the other kind of linguistic resources linked to Lila are textual resources. For instance, the Index Domesticus tree bank. And let's get, get back to the Index Domesticus. So uh, the, the Index Domesticus is available in two schemes, in two um, annotation schemes. The first one, and you see here the tree for this sentence, uh, resembles that of the Prague dependency tree bank of Czech. And then uh, recently the Index Domesticus tree bank was made available in universal dependencies. So here, the URI is assigned to a single token. And now let's focus on this single token, the token Estimato. It is assigned a URI and let's go to Estimato. And again, you have the data sheet and all the properties assigned to this specific token. Let's move to the visualization. So this is the token Estimato. Uh, I just have time to show you here how the dependencies are represented. So for instance, in this case, you see that Estimato is connected to the OC token by a specific dependency relation from the universal dependency scheme, which is ACL, ad nominal clause. So in other words, in the tree, Estimato depends on OC via ACL. Here it is. 
if we get back here, we see that estimato depends on OCK via ACL. And this is how a tree bank, for instance, is represented in LILA. An overview, the resources that are currently connected in LILA and the upcoming connections, which you see that there, we have some corpora, some lexica, and the Lemma Bank that is built upon an extended version of uh, a powerful morphological analyzer for Latin that is called LEMLAT. And uh, in this slide, I just report the links. So when I will make the slide available, you will be able to click on the link. So for instance, on Dante search, and you will go to the resource in the LILA knowledge base. This collects all, all the Latin uh, works by Dante. You know, we are in the year of Dante in Italy and not only in Italy. So everyone wanted to work on Dante, uh, including ourselves. So to conclude, well, there are several open challenges, several. I know it. It's not so easy, but believe us, we are doing our best to fully exploit digital text. That is to say, text in a form that both the humans and machines can use. Let's get back to what I said about the linked data. Make it impossible that machines can interpret semantically the relations holding between the things you deal with. Preferably in a way that leverages the unique capabilities of both in order to take the best for what, from what machines can do and from what human beings can do. Of course, there are challenges. The first, is one, the first one is making linked open data more accessible and usable. I know that it's not easy. We need to facilitate a wider participation in LOD by automating the processing of metadata and so the workflows for creating LOD, which is exactly what the Preta LOD project aims to do. Second, LOD is wonderful, it is open, it's accessible, but producing it takes money, takes time, a lot of expertise. So I hope that the, with this talk, I will uh, convince the, the, the high places in Clarin to give funds for data entry uh, according to LOD and also to build new models because there is a lot of work here. There are several models still missing for several types of data and metadata. For instance, for philology, I come from that uh, background and for critical editions, there is a lot of work to do. And of course, linked open data is a community-based effort. That's very important. We need to persuade, if we are convinced of this, developers of linguistic resources to adopt the linked open data practices and reaching consensus about around shared vocabularies, ontologies, data categories. If people do not uh, provide their resources uh, in a loud way, and if we do not share the same data categories, the same in some way language that describes the languages, well, we cannot reach the objective of interoperability. So we are working towards a shared and formal representation of what exists. Well, that's a, a very important objective, at least of what is there in linguistic resources. This is what an ontology is, the description of what is there, of what exists. So common language to turn a bubble upside down. And I want to close my talk quoting this because, uh, and let me get back to my beloved and very missed mentor, Father Roberto Busa, uh, whose uh, last book was entitled Rovesciando Babele, turning Babel upside down. And I'm convinced that people in Clarin are really working towards this, uh, this objective, turning Babel upside down to make our life with linguistic resources easier. And let me thank very much again, the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for bringing us towards this path from uh, this historical path from the work of Padre Busa to the linked open data, which is <laughs> a very, a very, very uh, time consuming and, uh, and difficult journey. So uh, now I open the floor for question. Please uh, write your questions in the chat so that uh, I can uh, read them and, uh, and Marco can uh, give his answers. And, uh, 
in order for, for, for you to, to think about, uh, to, to write your questions. I, I, I have a couple of questions for, for, for Marco. In particular, uh, you showed us at the beginning the wonderful historical pictures of uh, the in, from, from the Index Domesticus archive. Hmm? And uh, 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 these pictures come from the Booz archive. And as you know, uh, one of the research directions in Clare in, Clare in Italy is uh, the uh, preservation and enhancement of, uh, of archives. Mm. We work uh, in, uh, in Archivio Vivo, in audiovisual archive. So I'd like to ask you, uh, how do you manage, um, how do you preserve uh, this, uh, this archive? Grazie, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I'm always happy to talk about the, the archive. Uh, of, of Busa because uh, he wanted to donate the archive, the Busa archive, uh, to the, universe, to the uh, library of Università Cattolica a couple of years uh, before leaving us. Uh, Father Busa died in 2011. Uh, this is the, the first 10 years after the death of Father Busa. And uh, uh, well, the catalog, the, 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 the archive is fully cataloged in the, in the big catalog in the OPAC of the Library of Università Cattolica. It is not yet digitized. It is one of the objectives of my library. The first archive that will be digitized is the one of Father Agostino uh, Gemelli, uh, who is the founder of my university. And then in second place, there will be the death of Father Busa. And I will be so happy to provide a clarin with archive, so we will get in touch on this and talk about this. And believe me, I, I tell this to all the colleagues who are here today, it's a treasure. Uh, you, you, you see the story of our discipline. Sometimes I am invited to give talks about the Booz archive, and all I have to do is go to, to the archive, put my hand in a folder, basically by chance, and I extract something that I will talk about for one hour. And uh, uh, so you, you have photo, different kinds of materials, uh, photographs, uh, uh, um, magnetic tapes, uh, uh, punch cards, uh, letters, uh, believe me, hundreds and hundreds of letters with all the big names and all the small names and all the names in our field. And you have a lot of more than 2000 photographs and you have documents supporting the work of the uh, Index Domesticus. And not only, for instance, that it, there is a big part about the Dead Sea Scrolls work that was done by Father Busa in the 70s. So what I can, what I can do now is inviting you all to come to Milan and uh, put your hands on the archive, which is freely and openly available to all of you. And I will be happy to host you here because I'm always happy to talk about the Buddhist archive. So thank you very much. But we will talk about including the archive in Clark for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's important uh, also for us to, to, to taste uh, uh, to test, uh, sorry, uh, some uh, some of your of your uh, archival unit mm, and try to describe yeah. them with the model we we are building, we have built, and we are building, refining in a, in Archivio Vivo in Clarin Italy. So and I think... Antonio Zampoli is very much quoted there. So the name <laughs> of your <laughs> istituto, <laughs> yeah, it's not by chance. Okay, there is a question in the chat by Kirill, Kirill Simov for you, Marco. And uh, the question is whether LOT uh, provides also abilities for creation of language resources directly in LOT. Grazie, Kirill. Thank you very much for the questions. In principle, yes. In practice, no. Uh, this is one of the challenges. And uh, this is one of the aims of uh, the Preta Lod project. Preta Lod means just that, Preta Porte for linguistic resources in Lod. I want to build a new linguistic resource and I want to build it just now using uh, triples in some RDF serialization, like for instance, Tartle. And uh, this is exactly one of the words 
we are doing. Because uh, like uh, when we converted tree banks from uh, free structure tree banks to dependency tree banks, there was a time when the work of, of conversion was, was big. This is the time when linguistic resources are so we converted or moved to linked open data. Then came the time when the tree banks were built immediately in universal dependencies or in dependency like scheme. So the next step is building resources just in load, uh, but not yet in practice. But in terms of structural interoperability, yes, all the technical stuff is already there. I have another question if I'm not wrong. Yeah, there is a question from Jan, Jan Odaik. How is the performance of queries that require access to resources at different locations? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. This is one of my nightmares indeed, uh, because uh, the problem of scalability is there. Uh, currently in the LILA knowledge base, there are more than 30 million uh, triples and we have just uh, seven or eight linguistic resources for Latin. So a small language in some way uh, interlinked. So all I can answer now is uh, about the, the performances of the queries as they work now in the Lina knowledge base and they work very fast. I'm pretty surprised of this. Uh, there are some tricks that you can uh, do in order to make the resources fast, but uh, please invite me again in, in a couple of years and I will give you <laughs> A better answer, hopefully, working towards uh, working with some hundred millions of queries, uh, and maybe I will answer. Oh, it does not work at all. It takes a lot of time. Or maybe I will answer you. I'm surprised that it works. So currently, the answer is uh, queries are, are fast and they work well. Of course, it depends on the number of nodes that you have to traverse. But we run also very very complex uh, queries. Hmm. Currently, we are pretty happy with the results. Okay, there is another question from Paolo Budroni from, Va from Vine. Uh, he wants to know more about the visualization interface. What are your plans there? Uh, two plans. First, uh, the visualization interface that you have seen was not built by us, but it is, uh, it is called the Log Live and it is used. Uh, in the in the load world, we just uh, made uh, some specific application to our our needs, uh, but it's, it is freely available and uh, you can use it. The second plan is uh, uh, one of the work packages of the second part of the Lila project, which is building a hopefully easy to use interface to write queries. So my idea was that of a kitchen where you have ingredients and you want to uh, you want to cook a very good dish. Your very good dish is the, que is the query and the ingredients are the different resources that you can find in Lila. So in the second part of the, uh, of the project, we will build the, this visualization to write queries in a graphical mode because we have to address the needs and expertise of our users who are in many cases, not only computational linguists, but classicists. And try to teach a query, how to write a Sparkle query to a classicist. And I am a classicist. It's not an easy task. Even if they are really able to write Sparkle queries, they, when they are convinced to learn it. And, uh, and another question. Uh... For you, a visionary answer, I think. Let's imagine that suddenly all the language data become fully interoperable. What future applications do you envision? Uh, I have two minutes, sorry. Yes. Well, let's One go there. To, to answer. Yeah. You know, as a linguist, I would love to see, for instance, uh, how the, uh, the same Proto-Indo-European route uh, is lexically uh, used and represented in all the language of the world. But this is really a, an idea that comes out from my mind at uh, two minutes to 11 this morning. Uh, 
sky's the limit. You know, uh, imagine that suddenly all, all those beautiful resources that are there are connected into a link that you can query all of them in multilingual fashion. I see both NLP, uh, NLP applications that can benefit from this and link the theoretical linguistic research uh, stemming from this. Sorry for not being more precise because of I will work towards having it all in interoperable. And then if I'm not dead yet, well, uh, I hope that I will enjoy. Okay, and now- there was a question by... Yeah, a question from, from Valeria. What Valeria. So would you suggest in case uh, lemmatization is not a viable solution because lemma are uncertain? For example, uh, Valeria, is thinking about uh, ancient languages. Mm -hmm. So in some way, this is the question. Uh, we are collecting canonical forms. So this means that uh, the same lexeme can be referred to by different canonical forms. What does it mean? It means that, for instance, for participles, I hate participles because in some corpora, participles are lemmatized under the participle with part of speech adjective or sometimes noun or sometimes even verb. In some other corpora, they are lemmatized under the verb with the part of speech verb. And you get crazy, you have to harmonize both of them. In Lila, we do not want to force corpora developers to follow one specific criterion for lemmatizing. Use the lemma that you want. We will harmonize them in Lila. And indeed, for the case of participles and verbs, we have the lemma for amo, for instance, and then we have the so-called hypolemma for amatus, and they are interlinked by a specific property. So regardless of the fact that a form like amatorum in a corpus is lemmatized under amatus or under amo, they are harmonized in Lila. Second, uh, to answer again Valeria's uh, question, thanks for the, for the question, Valeria. Sorry, I don't have much time. Uh, we have a powerful lemmatizer for Latin, uh, and we have an interface where you can put your raw text for Latin and have not only the lemmatization, but also automatically the linking of each token in that text to the lemmas in uh, the lemma bank. Of course, there are ambiguous linkings. And then there, the data provider will decide what to do. Is ambiguating the ambiguous linking or not? Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. We have to close the session.